Next, we'll discuss how the two translations deal with gender. My favorite passage to examine on the topic of gender inclusiveness is Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Both the NES and the ESV employ what I call the classic gender-inclusive pronouns him and he in this passage. When I was a little boy, I was taught English grammar in school by women, most of whom were born before the Second World War, and some of them were born before the First. They taught me that he, him, and his were shared pronouns. They could refer to boys or girls, depending on the context. I still think of those pronouns and words like man and mankind in that way. The Old Revised Standard Version read, He who conquers here, like the NAS. The ESV changed that to the one who conquers. Personally, I have no problem with the ESV's use of the one who conquers here, and that use is in keeping with the 1997 Colorado Spring Guidelines. The translations of these verses you'll find in the 2011 NIV and the New Revised Standard Version are much more diligent in removing grammatically masculine pronouns. The NIV uses the singular they. The next example comes from John chapter 3, verse 36. Here we see that the old RSV used he who constructions, as the NAS still does. The ESV replaced he who with whoever. Again, I have no objection to that, but the replacement does show that the ESV translators and or editors were more sensitive to modern notions of gender inclusiveness than the NES translators and or editors were in the years leading up to 1995. In Romans 16, 7, a name appears that could be translated as either Junius, a man's name, or Junia, a woman's name, depending on how it is accented. The NET Bible provides a useful note regarding this issue. Incidentally, the NET Bible comes down on the same side as the ESV here. The NES goes with Junius, the masculine name, while the ESV takes the female name option, Junia. But to avoid the implication that Junia was an apostle, the ESV translates the Greek episteme in tis apostalis as well known to the apostles rather than outstanding among the apostles. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, we see two examples of the ESV taking a modern rather than a classic approach to gender inclusion. The RSV had man here, like the NES. The ESV replaced that with person. But notice that the RSV had anyone who eats in verse 29. That's the way it read back in 1946, the year Gloria Steinem turned 12. Let's look next at Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Here we see a disagreement over whether man or person is the best English word to use in the first sentence. We saw also encounter more pronoun replacements. The Greek word the NAS translates as man, and the ESV translates as person, as anthropos, which means man. Just as in the pre-1970s English, it sometimes refers to females also. The ESV has a tendency to avoid that gender-inclusive use of man, and so it employs person instead. But notice that the ESV has no issue with continuing to use the pronoun his in a gender-inclusive way. We'll move next to Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Here the ESV has man, while the NAS goes with people, which is rather different from what we've come to expect. The Greek word translated people and man here is anthropis. It's a plural form of the word man. The 1963 through 1977 NAS editions had men here. People was introduced in 1995. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, we continue the controversy between man and people. As shown in blue in verses 15 and 16, the NAS retains the use of the word men in its classic gender-inclusive sense, while the ESV prefers people. In verse 17, the old ASV had honor all men. The NAS continued to read men at that point until the 1995 revision. In my view, Replacing men with people is not controversial there, 
Perhaps people should be in italics. The RSV had men in both places in verses 15 and 16, where the ESV reads people, and it had honor all men in verse 17, even though the word men doesn't appear in Greek. Glancing ahead at the upcoming revision of the NAS, it appears likely that the NAS will replace men with people in this passage. It also intends to ditch bond slaves in favor of bond servants. Finally, notice that both the NAS and the ESV translates teen adelphantita as the brotherhood. As far as I can tell, the 2020 NAS also intends to retain brotherhood here. More boldly, gender-inclusive translations like the 2011 NIV and then then the NRSV replaced the brotherhood with the family of believers. We'll back up to Romans chapter 1, verse 13. The NAS follows the ASV in employing the word brethren here. The RSV also had brethren, but the ESV modernized that to brothers. According to the second edition of Bauer's Lexicon, 1979, the ESV's footnote here is accurate. The plural Adelphi can indeed mean brothers and sisters. It appears that the next edition of the NAS will drop brethren in favor of brothers and sisters. Assuming that Paul meant to address both male and female members of the church in Rome, my only difficulty with brothers and sisters is that and sisters is italicized. If Adelphi means brothers and sisters here, the italics are not needed. But I think a comma is needed after also. Now we move to other comparisons that interest me. I've arranged them under three headings. First, general differences. Second, interpretive insertions and the use of the italic font. And third, plural pronouns. So we'll move along to an examination of general differences starting in John, chapter 1, verse 18. Both the NAS and the ESV translate a Greek text that includes the word God. Many of the older translations were working from a text that included the word Son, so they read Only Begotten Son, like the KJV, or Only Son, like the RSV, instead of Only Begotten God. The NAS and the ESV differ in the way they translate the Greek word monogenes. The NAS takes it to mean only begotten, while the ESV, like the RSV before it, translates it as only. I'm not a philologist, just a Bible reviewer, so I depend on lexicons. Bauer gives unique, or only, as the primary meaning of monogenes, but he also notes that some experts lean toward only begotten. According to a post at the Lockman Foundation's Facebook page, This verse will read as follows in the 2020 edition of the NAS. No one has seen God at any time. God the only Son, who is in the arms of the Father, he has explained him. It appears that the 2020 NAS arrives at God the only Son by translating monogenes as only Son, which is what it appears to mean in John 1.14. The New Revised Standard Version also reads God the only Son. Both the NAS and the ESV's parent, the RSV, have in the bosom of the Father at the end of the verse. Sadly, the ESV replaced this literal rendering with at the Father's side. Changes like this may be why I've never been able to love the ESV. But it isn't all good news for the NAS. You may have noticed on that last chart that the next edition of the NAS will replace in the bosom of the Father with in the arms of the Father. Our second stop is at Titus chapter 2, verse 13. The first hour is missing from the Greek, but and is present. In both these instances, the NAS is more literal. Both translations affirm the deity of Christ at the end of the verse, in accordance with the Granville Sharp rule, but the NAS provides a different view in its footnote. The next comparison at Romans chapter 9, verse 5, is also on the theme of Christ's deity. First, note that the phrase from whom in the NAS is more literal than the ESV's from their race. The translation from their race is a slight adjustment to the RSV's of their race. 
At the end of the verse, the ESV provides a translation that clearly supports the deity of Christ. Here, the ESV is markedly different from the RSV. The RSV read, According to the flesh is the Christ, full stop. God, who is over all, be blessed forever. Amen. As if Paul changed subjects after mentioning Christ. In my view, the ESV more clearly proclaims Christ's deity in this verse than the NAS does. The two translations are identical in the highlighted words in this chart, so why am I showing it? Because, in my opinion, both translations need to include an explanatory footnote at this point. The Greek phrase is literally, by faith, of Jesus Christ. A literal rendering, like that in the KJV, permits the reader to decide whether that means by faith in Jesus Christ or by Jesus Christ's own faithfulness. Both the NAS and the ESV assume that by faith in Christ is intended, neither as much as supplies a hint to let the reader know that there's another way to understand that expression. The NET Bible reads, The Faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It has a footnote that explains why. Sometimes when we make changes, we make mistakes. There may be a few such mistakes in this video. I want to point out that a mistake was made in the footnote to the left during the 1995 revision. Reading the footnote as it stands on the lower left-hand part of this chart, we might think that the verse literally reads, but the scripture has shut up things under sin. We know that can't be right. Here's what went wrong. The 1977 NAS read, but the scripture has shut up all men under sin. And it added a footnote to explain that, rendered literally, men is actually things. The 1995 edition removed the word men. It replaced all men with everyone. But it neglected to alter the footnote to read literally all things. Incidentally, the Greek phrase translated everyone in the NAS is tapanta. The ESV's everything is more literal than the NAS's everyone, as the footnote in the NAS, when it is eventually corrected, will show. Incidentally, the next revision of the NAS is supposed to replace shut up with confined. I hope they repair the footnote. We'll see. A lengthier passage here in Ephesians chapter 1. The NAS translates the Greek word e as with a view to twice in this short section of the text. The old ASV had unto in these spots. The translation with a view to has always struck me as clumsy. Happily, the upcoming 2020 edition of the NAS will remove, remove these with a view to's. They'll be replaced by regarding and in regard to. The NAS and ESV are significantly different near the end of verse 14. The Greek is terse and, as the ESV footnote points out, can be read in two ways. A relatively literal translation is, who is a pledge of our inheritance unto redemption of the possession. Next we move to Colossians chapter 1 verse 29. Here I want to point out what I see as an ambiguity in the ESV. In verse 29 the RSV read, striving with all the energy that he mightily inspires within me. The ESV replaced striving with struggling perhaps to improve readability. But in doing so, it made the passage ambiguous, because struggling with can mean either struggling in cooperation with or struggling against. If I struggle with insomnia, that doesn't mean that insomnia and I are allies. Looking earlier in the verse, it's clear that we could have placed this example in the gender section of the video. The NAS reads man, the ESV, person, as we've come to expect. With that, we end the section on general differences and move on to italics. This first example taken from 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 and 19 will give you an idea of what I have in mind. Notice the word now in blue at the end of the verse. By inserting now, it seems to me that the NAS is privileging interpretations of this passage that view the proclamation as having been made to the spirits before they entered prison, perhaps while they were still alive. The ESV and most translations avoid that bias. Happily, because the word is in italics, we know we can safely ignore it. 
In passing, I'll draw your attention to a difference in the first line that's due to the fact that the NAS and the ESV are translating different source texts. And, as we've come to expect, the NAS agrees with Westcott and Hort, the ESV, with an A28. We move now to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6. This passage may or may not be related to the one we just discussed. Commentators differ. At any rate, it addresses a similar topic. Uncharacteristically, the NAS inserts an interpretive footnote. That footnote explains that the gospel was preached to people who are now dead, not to dead people. I would have preferred it had the NAS editors left that sort of interpretation to the commentaries and study Bibles. Now, let's take a look at the end of the verse, since the two translations differ there. A literal translation would read, For unto this also was the gospel proclaimed to the dead, so that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. The ESV avoids the word men, and it provides an explanation for what is meant by according to men and according to God that preserves the parallel construction present in the Greek. The NES obscures the parallel construction and inserts the will of in italics. Since the words are in italics, we know that they provide the translator's explanation and we can safely ignore them. With the ESV, the reader can't know how interpretive the translation is unless he or she consults the Greek, other translations, or a good commentary. In Romans chapter 1, verse 9, the NAS inserts an expression that I believe is unnecessary and potentially misleading, but at least, again, it's in italics. Those words are preaching of the, shown here in blue. Paul says that he serves God in his spirit in the gospel. He doesn't restrict that to the preaching of the gospel, as the inserted words imply. A post at the Lockman Foundation's Facebook page indicates that the next edition of the NAS will continue to include the words in blue. So in those examples, the NAS inserted something, whether in italic font or in a footnote, which I wish they hadn't inserted. But at least the insertions in italic font are in italic font, so the reader can spot them. In this example, taken from Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, I wish the ESV had used a special font to mark interpretive words inserted by the translators. Translated literally, this verse reads, Here is the endurance of the saints, those keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, a call for isn't in the original language. It's an interpretation on the part of the translators. But because the ESV doesn't use a special font for explanatory language, the reader is not aware and may confuse the translator's explanation with what was actually written. Looking at the end of the verse, we see that both translations depart from the literal sense. Happily, both provide informative footnotes. Another place where the ESV would benefit from the use of italics is Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. The word only is an insertion. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, both the NAS and the ESV insert the words of God into the text. Since it doesn't use italic font, the ESV misleads the reader into thinking of God represents something in the Greek. It does not. But by placing of God in italic font, the NAS permits the reader to consider other possibilities. Both the NES and the ESV are like their parent translations in this passage. The ESV replaced the RSVs, we are now justified, with we have now been justified. I checked to see if other translations inserted of God. To save time, I'll let you pause the video to read the chart if you're interested. Our final example on the use of italics comes from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 13. The ASV, parent to the NAS and grandparent to the ESV, provides a literal translation. Till I come, give heed to reading, to exhortation, to teaching. The NAS made the interpretive insertions in italics in its 1963 edition. Since they are in italics, the reader understands that they are an explanation supplied by the translator. The ESV, on the other hand, gives the reader no hint that those words are not in the original.
Public reading may have been in Paul's mind, but the Greek word he used for reading is anagnosis. The word means reading, whether public or private. St. John Chrysostom, who certainly knew Greek, commented as follows, Even Timothy is commanded to apply to reading. Let us then be instructed not to neglect the study of the sacred writings. To him, the key message conveyed was reading to study. It's difficult to imagine what written works apart from Scripture Paul may have wished Timothy to read, but in my opinion, interpretations like these are better left to the commentaries. So in keeping with our theme, let me say that the ESV would benefit from the use of italic font here to mark translator-supplied explanations. I wish the RSV, the ESV's immediate predecessor, had also employed italic font. By the way, the NAS should have placed the word and in italics also. Our final subtopic, under the general heading of Other Noteworthy Differences, deals with the way the two translations deal with the plural pronoun you. In 21st century English, we can't distinguish between you singular and you plural except by context. The older translations didn't have that problem since they used different words like the and ye for the singular and plural. Our first example is from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 51. In the verses immediately preceding John 151, Jesus and Nathanael have been speaking to each other, but here, while continuing to speak to Nathanael, Jesus begins to address a larger group. The difference is hidden in the NAS, but the ESV adds a footnote to highlight the change. Note, however, that the NAS provides a different insight into the underlying Greek, one hidden in the ESV. The NAS marks with an asterisk Greek verbs that are historical presents, but which have been translated with an English past tense to conform to modern usage. In this case, a literal translation would be, he says. Compare the KJV. A second example is located in Acts, the fifth chapter, verses 8 and 9. The ESV places a footnote beside the first you because we expect it to be singular, since Peter is addressing Sapphira alone. For the second you, the ESV editors may have thought the context, agreed together, was sufficient for the reader to understand that the word you is plural there. The NAS does not tell the reader that either pronoun is plural. Before we leave, notice that the footnotes in the NAS say that the ESV is more literal when it uses the phrase, for so much, rather than for such and such a price, or that was the price. For our final example on the topic of plural pronouns, we move to Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. The ESV marks the change from plural to singular in this passage with the footnote to the right. But a person reading the NAS without access to the Greek will likely be unaware of the change. By the way, the plural you in verse 31 is actually present in the Greek only once, as shown in the NAS. Here's the way this passage reads in the KJV. The shift from plural to singular there is obvious. There are other things a person should consider when choosing a translation. I'll touch on a few of them next. The cross-reference set may be important to you. The NAS advertises 95,000 cross-references, while the ESV says it provides 80,000. I didn't take the time to count them, but I did a spot check in Isaiah chapter 1 and Romans chapter 1. My results are shown on this chart. The totals seem not to disagree with the advertised numbers. Certainly, the NAS has more references than the ESV in these two chapters. If you're like me, you want to know about variant readings in the text, and you'd like to know if the passage you're reading can be translated differently. So I spot-checked text and translation notes in the two translations also. Here, I looked at Isaiah chapter 1 again, but I added the entire book of uh, Romans. I didn't have time to score the entire book of Isaiah and also make this video. The results are shown here. In a nutshell, the ESV and the NAS print about the same number of text notes, notes that tell you about variant readings in the text. The NAS gives you many more translation notes 
In my opinion, many of the NAS translation notes display literal readings that should have been in the text in the first place. A few other things to consider are shown on this chart. The ESV gives you more variety to choose from. If you consider the deuterocanonical books part of the scriptures, or if, like me, you come from a tradition that encourages reading them even if they aren't scripture, be aware that the deuterocanonical books are available in the ESV. In fact, the Augustine Bible was published at the end of 2019, I think, and it features a Catholic edition of the ESV. The Anglican Church in North America also makes available an edition of the ESV that includes the deuterocanonical books. Copies of the ESV in verse-by-verse -verse format are somewhat hard to come by, especially inexpensive editions. The NAS has suffered from poor quality editions in recent years, but that may have changed with the recent comfort print editions from Zondervan. The NAS is being revised, as we've seen repeatedly. Perhaps as early as the spring of 2021, a new edition of the NAS will be published. Fortunately, the 1995 edition, the one we've discussed in this video, should still be available for a time. Personally, I wish the 1977 edition were also still widely available in multitudes of editions. I'm not going to say which of these translations I prefer. As a primary translation, both are better, in my opinion, than a number of bland, uninspiring translations in informal English that are popular these days. But if it were up to me, I would change the ESV as follows. Introduce italic font for translator-supplied explanatory language. Bring back pithy vocabulary and expressions that earlier editors have deleted. I realize that this is opposite to the zeitgeist. For instance, I would go back to the RSVs. Think not that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. The ESV has do not think, which strikes me as vanilla by comparison. Insert more translation notes. Make more verse-by-verse -verse editions available. Improve the quality of the typeface and paper to keep up with Nelson and Zondervan. Since Crossway also publishes the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, perhaps they should base the ESV's New Testament on it. I would also like to see a more aggressive use of the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient versions in the Old Testament. How would I improve the NAS? As I mentioned before, I would move many literal readings from the footnotes to the text. I think that change alone would give the NAS more character, make it seem less prosaic, academic, and clinical. As with the ESV, I would restore much of the older biblical vocabulary and forms of expression. I would alter the way the Greek imperfect tense is translated, as I described on an earlier chart. I would repair a number of specific translations, some of which we've seen earlier. And I would, at a minimum, introduce more notes into the Old Testament to inform the reader of alternative readings from the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient versions. One more chart and we're done. We'll finish with this summary comparison chart. I'll not read it to you, but I do want to let you know that MOD period means moderate. Please pause the video to examine the chart in detail. Thank you for your time, and please like the video, share it with your friends and colleagues, and subscribe to the channel.